Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Hahn, the Craig M. Burge Dean of the College, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the final installment of our spring faculty lecture series. Our goal remains the same, to share the college's research success and impact with our alumni and friends, many of who generously support this college and have truly helped to make this happen. So today's talk is entitled, Additive Manufacturing on Earth and Beyond. The United States is currently the world's third largest manufacturer behind China and the European Union. You know, looking back to the 1980s, US manufacturing was hit by increases in foreign productivity, notably in Japan, and appreciation of the US dollar making imports cheaper. There's been some up and down cycles since, but at present, the US share of the global manufacturing has risen to its largest share since 2009, namely to 18.6%. And U.S. manufacturers lead the world in R&D spending, helping to maintain our technological edge. Today, we're going to explore one of the most revolutionary changes in manufacturing in many decades, the advent of additive manufacturing. As you will learn today, additive manufacturing changes the paradigm of starting with large pieces of material and cutting that away to create the desired piece. You know, think of Michelangelo starting with a solid block of marble and creating the sculpture David. In contrast, additive manufacturing, or AM as people call it, is like building a sand tower at the beach by steadily dripping wet sand layer by layer, higher by higher. This opens the door to creating complex shapes that are really unimaginable by traditional machining or working at remote locations or even in space. Today, you will hear about efforts to advance the technology and applications of additive manufacturing. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Krishna Muraladharan, Krishna is an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering here at the University of Arizona with joint appointments at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory and the Graduate Interdisciplinary Program in Applied Math. Currently, Krishna serves as the co-director of the Additive Manufacturing Initiative at the University of Arizona. Krishna earned his PhD from the University of Arizona in 2004. And prior to joining us as a faculty member, he worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory and at the University of Florida. Krishna has a rich history of successful collaborations on many multidisciplinary, multi-institute grants and currently heads the Regents Innovation Fund on Advanced Manufacturing, which is funded by the Arizona Board of Regents to promote additive manufacturing across the three state universities in Arizona. He serves on the Technical Advisory Board of the NCMSARL supported Advanced Manufacturing Materials and Processes Consortium and is a member of the organizing committee of the Arizona Tech Council on Additive Manufacturing. Welcome, Krishna. I'd also like to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Andrew Westman. Andrew joined the University of Arizona Material Science and Engineering Department following a previous position as a staff engineer at GE Additive. During 14 years at GE, Andrew worked at GE Aviation to develop polycrystalline nickel superalloys for use in turbine engine rotating parts. This work also included development, developing the foraging, welding, and computational modeling capabilities necessary to utilize these materials in safety critical components. Andrew moved to GA Additive prior to the launch of this new GE business early in 2017 and led development of high temperature materials and processes for additive manufacturing. He has a BS and MS degrees in metallurgical engineering from the University of Utah and a PhD in material science from the University of Cincinnati. Welcome. Andrew. Before we get into the technical details of your presentation, like we've often done, we'll start with one question about our educational mission. How might educational institutions such as ours keep pace and prepare students to work in advanced manufacturing beyond their university days, supporting local government, commercial ventures? I'll go with you, Krishna, and then to Andrew. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dean Han, for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, to answer this question, it may, I mean, you know, we could very well take the entire duration on this talk uh, because it's such an important question. Uh, I, let me start off by saying that, you know, uh, manufacturing is very hands-on and experiential. And um, over the last few, I mean, a decade or so, it's also becoming very smart, uh, meaning it involves, uh, integrates uh, advances in sensing, in data science, using pedigree data, and also extreme customization. Uh, and uh, in this regard, additive is a prime example that leverages all of the above and is very interdisciplinary in its nature. So from an educational point of view, right, uh, we need to set the stage for the future students 
um, and professionals uh, to fully appreciate and get trained on this whole spectrum of engineering and science that goes from you know materials to design principles to system architecture uh, to like systems engineering to all the way to supply chain management in conjunction with like data the advances in data science computing and sensing and uh, by doing this you you're ensuring that they are future ready and future proof so, so it's it's very important from that point of view so in, in this regard it's very important for us to to have dedicated agile and curated manufacturing curricula which involves industry personnel both benefiting and contributing to and this could be done through you know uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing on campus which is to develop the minor in additive manufacturing that's open to all uh, students in the college of engineering a future uh, program and also developing certificate curated certificate programs for industry personnel to keep keep pace with the latest developments Excellent. having said that uh, we need to work very closely and in tandem with industry to proactively create these opportunities and these opportunities could either be you know industry personnel getting trained uh, on the latest as also for us uh, being in academia being getting embedded into their ecosystem once in a while to understand where you know from industry perspective this is heading uh, and oh sorry no, I was going to say, if, if, if you want to continue, otherwise, to keep us on time, I'm going to turn to Andrew and get his. Yep. Thank you, Krishna. Yep. Yeah, Sorry. I, I, I really uh, would like to echo everything that Krishna has said. And I'd say that in addition to that, I think a lot of what the University of Arizona's College of Engineering is doing and moving towards a four year design program really helps to reinforce what Krishna just said. Uh, I think getting students to have an interdisciplinary outlook going into their engineering programs from the start really helps to set the stage for them to be successful later in careers where their engineers are going to have to interact with a lot of different disciplines during their career and, and be able to speak the language of people not only in their specific discipline, but also in all the adjacent fields that they're going to work with. So, you know, as an example in working in a turbine engine manufacturer, I was dealing a lot with mechanical engineers electrical engineers and the control systems groups and people like that. And so having a, a good sense of what they're doing and what their goals are is I think very important. And I think that's four year design program really helps to reinforce that. The senior capstone projects are also a great way to get that exposure to industry folks and their thought processes, their way of running development work uh, to really get students to, by the time they graduate, uh, have that basic understanding of the way the world works and be ready to be successful from day one at whatever their next step is. No, I think it's great the way you both not only prepare our students with the fundamentals, but are also, as you just both noted so nicely, preparing them for really what does work look like once they graduate. So thanks for that. So now what I'm going to do is turn it over to Andrew and Krishna to present um, you know, a brief presentation of to kind of set the stage for our Q&A. So I'm going to turn the stage over to Andrew and Krishna, share your screen and uh, to go. Great. Um, so let me start off. And uh, once again, let me thank De uh, Dean Han for this opportunity and, uh, and for everyone in the audience. Um, I'm, I'm Krishna Muralidharan and with me is Andrew. And I'm just waving in case you couldn't distinguish between us. <laughs> um, and, and today we're going to talk about some of the advances uh, that we've made uh, in manufacturing by establishing the additive manufacturing initiative and we are presenting uh, all of this on on the ami we have uh, we talk, we'll talk about how we are pushing the frontiers of manufacturing by using additive manufacturing as an engine for this um, for pushing these beyond uh, pushing the, uh, the the frontiers and uh, not only are we going to show showcase some of our um, research innovations that we've uh, created on campus, but also towards the end, we'll also focus a little bit on how we've been developing workforce development modules and uh, preparing students, um, just like how uh, based on uh, Dean Han's question. So out here um, are some some pictures that we've uh, we've put uh, forth on on the left. Uh, that was the first artifact we 3D printed uh, as part of the AMI initiative. So for historical purposes, uh, that's that's pretty important. And beneath, we are uh, just showcasing some of our you know 3D printing abilities. Um, and Andrew, if you want to go ahead for the next slide, um, yeah. So on the left top uh, is actually a graphene aerogel that we 3D printed. Its uh, density is very low. We call it the um, Muhammad Ali of our artifacts and our articles because it uh, 
fly and its multifunction and its um, ability to be used as an electrode for supercapacitors and batteries or uh, you know filtration membranes you know it, it really delivers a big punch uh, so that's that was 3d printed on campus beneath um, uh, is uh, the meteorite A, which was completely 3D printed using a meteorite sample, um, and uh, which has great implications for space applications, for example. This is just to just a demonstration. And on the right top are, are bio scaffolds that were developed at the College of Medicine that were 3D printed to, to initiate bone growth and uh, that could be implanted into um, into, into patients. Uh, and then a couple of other examples are one that was a, a metal 3D printed part uh, that Andrew will talk about. And on to the extreme right bottom is a COVID 3D uh, PPE mask that, that we 3D printed, which showed much higher efficacy than even N95. This is just you know tip of the iceberg for all the activities that's going on as part of the AMI, but just to give you a feel for what's coming ahead. Uh, Andrew, the next slide. And uh, while, and, very quickly, I'll hand over to Andrew, but just to give you a feel for how broad, how transdisciplinary this AMI is on campus. Uh, it involves uh, professors and faculty from orthopedics all the way to uh, professors from architecture and planning um, to uh, even School of Behavioral Sciences to all, uh, lunar and planetary sciences to optical sciences to, to uh, amongst other core engineering faculty by that we've represented and um, importantly you know when this was initiated we didn't have it was all the faculty who you know were working on AM but weren't AM specialists per se but in the last few years the College of Engineering has made strategic hires bringing in real true experts like uh, Andrew uh, for example uh, then Mohammed Shafe and Hannah Budinov from SIE and just to give you a feel for the focus has now been you know let's push AM both on uh, both at the college level and on across campus um, so very quickly what as at the AMI what do we do Right, uh, Andrew, the next slide. Um, so, you know, this is a riff, if you can just, uh, this is just a riff of, uh, on the my, um, Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, the man, you know, the evolution of the man. So what we see here is uh, AM is really the future uh, manufacturing technology or one of the primary future uh, manufacturing technologies. And we are involved in a lot of different activities. Uh, one of some of the salient activities involve, you know, space manufacturing, uh, but also developing, you know, the, the next generation uh, 3D printed parts, either be it for um, aerospace, biomedical, uh, communication, the whole swath of uh, engineering applications that's possible. And for that, we are creating lots of new sensing, lots of new um, qualification protocols that I think Andrew will stress later, as well as uh, developing lots of work, new workforce development modules that that will help both the UFA stay ahead of the curve, but also produce next generation future proof students and workforce, you know, who not who not only serve the needs of the nation, but can also represent UFA really well. And uh, just our mission is really, you know, when we first set it up was solving industry challenges and really creating tomorrow's leaders. And with that, Andrew, yeah, so we'll talk about a few different examples of additive manufacturing uh, from different programs that are active on, on campus. And you can see what's kind of outlined in the boxes here. But just want to reiterate that this is certainly a large effort across campus that involves a lot of different people and, and not only the College of Engineering, but also in places like Optical Sciences. So we'll give you kind of a sampling of what's going on here. But uh, this is really something that's really bridging a, a large part of the university campus at the moment. So what is additive manufacturing? You know, it's, it's sort of the industrial version of what's commonly known as 3D printing. And what we're trying to do here is build up a component by adding material layer by layer to build up this three-dimensional object. And we're usually doing that by using some kind of a computer-controlled method that's going to put material where we want it based on a digital model. And this gives us a number of advantage over advantages over traditional manufacturing techniques. Uh, which can be referred to as subtractive manufacturing or, or fabrication techniques. Uh, this really does allow for on-demand production. So if you have a machine and you have a digital file, you can very quickly create the object that you're looking for. It also enables some very complex structures that are not manufacturable by other means. So if you have a 
a truss structure or something like this, it's very complicated. Getting machine tools in here to meet machinists from a solid block of material can be very difficult. It's also a one-step process. So you're, you're creating this article in, in one step without the needs for a lot of subsequent processing. Uh, it also eliminates the need for tooling. If I'm going to make a casting or a forging or something like that, I need to have dies uh, or molds in order to, to form the metal to the shape. And this is really a free form process that allows you to make an object without that kind of a tool. So it also can reduce or eliminate a lot of assembly needs. If you can completely make one very complicated object in one go, you may not have to make a complex object out of many smaller components that are then fitted together and joined via something like an adhesive or welding or whatever you need to do to do that. So in general, the outer manufacturing uh, market has been seeing quite a bit of growth in the last few years. And right now, the, the real leaders in this area are, are the United States, but also Germany, which has uh, been a leader in developing a lot of the metal added manufacturing processes. And then a lot of the other larger industrial companies are sort of leading the way in this new technology. And year over year, we're seeing a, a very large growth rate here. So uh, things are uh, essentially starting to grow at more of an exponential rate. You're seeing a lot more applications across a lot more industries. And that's driving a lot more adoption of this via uh, many different types of companies trying to get into the space to take advantage of the complexity you can get from this process. And so currently, there's a lot of the uh, Outer manufacturing processes across a lot of different industries. And so in terms of things like motor vehicles, that cer certainly is a large share of the market right now. And then consumer products, uh, just consumer 3D printing processes are, are still a very significant part of that market. Uh, but we'll talk about some uh, technologies that are developing now that are really expanding the space for more advanced applications and things like aerospace and medicine. And so, you know, where does this come from and, and where is this going? This really started as a way to do rapid prototyping. So a way to make functional prototypes that you can use to test out a certain design concept or see fit or function within a larger system. Uh, and so this uh, rapid prototyping has been in the works for about 30 years. It really uh, has come into its own and is used pretty regularly for that. Uh, the Next most common uh, mode of using additive manufacturing ended up being actually for uh, molds and tooling. So rather than trying to directly manufacture a finished product, you could manufacture the tooling you needed to make that product. And that'd be a, a way to more rapidly create the kinds of uh, tools you would need in a manufacturing environment to very quickly move from one product to the next in a production environment. And so people like Michelin, for example, have been 3D printing metal uh, tire tread molds uh, as part of their production process. We're really starting to move now into this realm of digital manufacturing and personal fabrication. So directly making parts that can be used in the end use application, and then starting to work on taking advantage of the flexibility in this process to make personal customizable articles for people for a wide range of things. And this is really gonna enable manufacturing to move from large centralized factories to more globally distributed flexible manufacturing. So instead of having one large factory overseas, you make a bunch of stuff and, and they're putting it in shipping containers and sending that all over the world. We can develop the intellectual property or the designs uh, in a certain engineering location that can go to a lot of distributed manufacturing facilities all around the world. That allows for reduced shipping, faster lead times, and uh, but it also allows for other things like manufacturing in austere environments, so places that are hard to get to. And space is sort of an obvious version of that, but shipping in military theaters can be very dangerous. Uh, and being able to print repair parts on demand at whatever location you're at can be a, a big advantage there as well. Same thing for something like a mine. If you're in a remote mine in the middle of Chile, it may be convenient to be able to make a repair part for your mine trucks uh, on site rather than having to wait for that to get shipped to you. And so AM really includes a, a variety of processes and materials. There are metal, ceramic, and polymer or plastic printing processes. And these can occur in a number of different forms. So uh, we'll talk about a couple of different versions of that, but it's really just 
a, a wide variety of different processes and different materials that fall under this umbrella. And so I'm going to do the first example here, and that's high value aerospace prototypes and components. You know, how are we using this new technology to make things for the aerospace industry? And aerospace is really an ideal industry for AM because you have high value parts that you're making at relatively low volumes compared to something like the automotive industry. Something in the 10,000 parts per year would be very large in aerospace, but relatively small for, for automotive. And AM has really been used about 20 years now in aerospace, but it started out as more of a repair process. So you can see in the picture here, using a blown powder deposition process to repair turbines. And so in terms of making new parts, it's really only been since about 2015 that aerospace parts have entered production in a new make uh, form for, for aerospace. And that started with this fuel nozzle from GE that's used in, in GE's LEAP engine. And so right now they've produced greater than 30,000 of these. They're flying around every day on the 737 MAX and Airbus A320 NEO aircraft that use the LEAP engine. And this design is really not producible with other methods. It's a fuel nozzle. It's, it has a lot of passages that are responsible for swirling together the air and the fuel prior to combustion. And so you have a lot of different passageways that help to atomize that fuel. It's a very small, complex part. And there are a lot of advantages to using AM in this sense. You can reduce the number of parts from 20 down to one. Uh, you can get a 25% weight reduction, you remove some of the overstock or joining points within that structure so you can make it lighter. It also gives you better durability because you don't have these weak points related to welding or brazing joints. And you can come up with a more efficient design because you have that freedom to uh, increase the complexity of the passages within it and just 3D print them. You don't pay for the complexity. And that process that you use to make that part is what's called metal powder bed fusion. And so you're, you're spreading a very thin layer of powder across the top of a build plate. You're gonna melt that into a uh, design based on what your computer file says and get the final component out of it uh, straight from the system. So currently this is the most common AM method used. Uh, it's accounting for about 80% of the metal AM market. Uh, it gives you really nice detail resolution, good surface finish. You get parts that look very good coming out of the machine. It's relatively efficient. You can actually reuse the powder that you don't use in making the part. But it has disadvantages, like it can only do fairly small articles that actually fit in the machine. So the machine we have here, which was uh, kindly donated by Honeywell, has a build area of about uh, four inches square. So you're, you're really looking at small, intricate parts that you can do in these sorts of systems. The, uh, Industrial versions are about a 10 inch square build plate. But these things are getting used also in building rockets. And so you can see people like uh, Elon Musk uh, sending things out on Twitter about 3D printed rocket uh, combustion chambers that they have in their rocket designs. And so we're seeing a lot of this now in, from rocket manufacturers, but this is really what people like Lockheed Martin Space Systems are going to start using for critical parts for spacecraft. So we've got this great OSIRIS-REx mission that U of A is uh, managing and, and future versions of that are largely going to be made by AM. But we do have some technology challenges that really limit more widespread adoption of that. And that's where a lot of our research is going now. So the, the AM process itself produces very different structures in the metal versus cast or uh, forged products. Uh, and then we have a lot of issues in terms of understanding the quality control. Of it. So we can't really monitor the process well enough to detect a lot of defects. And we need to figure out how to test these shapes when we're making the shape at the same time we're making the material. So it's a more of a, a challenge in understanding what we have. Uh, and so we really need to develop new alloys, new processing methods, and new ways of monitoring that process in, in order to control it. So as an example, uh, this is some of the work I was doing while I was at GE. We developed a material that would have high strength at temperatures up to about 1400F and developed this nickel super alloy for use in turbine engines. And this is a forged alloy. And so in that context, it had been very successful. Right now it's produced probably above 10 million pounds a year. And it's used across most of GE's engine lines. And so we looked at the use cases we had for adder manufacturing and figured out that we needed a material that would operate under similar conditions. But when we make those components using adder manufacturing, we get a very different structure at a microscopic scale relative to the prior version of the material. So we have this kind of a cellular structure here in the AM material. 
versus more of these spherical precipitates that provide the strength in the rock material. But we can come up with ways to thermally process the material after the build in order to make these properties and microstructures more similar to what we expect from the rock version. So if we take this added material and sort of use a modified version of the standard heat treatment we use on the forge material, we can get something that looks somewhat similar and starts to behave similar. But we actually have some advantages in this and that the, the reaction of the material to the heat treatment can be different and we can actually manipulate that to get something that's uh, actually going to potentially give us an advantage. And we're able to do that in this alloy and get something that has 10 times longer life than creep, which is a high temperature deformation. mechanism. So we can use a lot of our knowledge of what's going on at a fundamental level in these materials to improve their performance and make them more useful for more use cases in the future. So I'm going to pass this back to Krishna to talk a bit about some of the medical implementations. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so very quickly, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll speed through this. Uh, this is work that was uh, carried out at the College of Medicine, the PIs being uh, John Sevick and uh, David Margolis at the College of Medicine and Doug Loy, uh, contributing a lot towards uh, material development. Uh, and this, the whole idea is, could we develop personalized implants, in this case, bioscaffolds are being planted to, to hasten or speed up bone growth. And in this regard, this is just an example of showing like, you know, the, the power of AM, but essentially what you do is you take a piece of bone three, th uh, using 3D reconstruction, you know, uh, come up with the design for 3D printing of that part. And then once you 3D print that part, you, you uh, infuse uh, stem cells into it and then implant it. If you can go to the next, uh, next slide, Andrew. And basically, then you 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 attach uh, sensors to it to to examine its efficacy. And what you notice is, you know, in these biomimetic scaffolds, once you implant it, um, it allows for rapid growth of uh, of cells as well as bonding to the to the environment in some sense. So this was a great example of the power of AM or a 3D printing. And um, in order to you know, just, just, just the slide in the middle, the, the figure in the middle shows you like how one with the scaffold, 3D printed scaffold and cells really promotes um, growth and adherence. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, the, the idea here is the previous scaffolds were 3D printed using plastic. So from a materials point of view, how do you make it compatible? How do you ensure that FDA approves it? And then that's where the material scientists come in and, and figure out ways of integrating uh, mineral powders in this in, in this case is a tricalcium phosphate uh, integrated with the with the plastics and then 3D print these parts and if you go to the next slide without any loss in efficacy in fact you probably get much better mechanical response by putting in the minerals and by putting in the minerals what you also ensure is um, better uh, adherence as well as uh, less um, you know. Um, uh, better compatibility with the human body. So this is one example of how you know uh, 3D printing really helps in the biomedical um, uh, fields. The next example that I'll quickly go through was you know this was uh, like almost a challenge that was thrown to the 3D printing group is if we could 3D print masks very quickly. And initially the idea was um, when there was a scarcity of PPEs, whether we could 3D print masks. And what we did, what we did demonstrate uh, very well was, you know, working with the College of Medicine team uh, led by Sairam Parthasardi and uh, lots of the testing was done at Armin Soroshian's uh, lab in chemical engineering. What we showed is that we could 3D print very highly customizable uh, COVID PPEs that have very much higher efficacy. In fact, the chart on the right shows you that our efficacy is much closer to N99 than N95. Um, we did work with a local a manufacturer of filters, um, so uh, the filters which was incorporated into, into the mask. But again, uh, this was another success of the 3D printing uh, initiative, the additive manufacturing initiative, where you know we were agile enough, nimble enough to to um, to jump to face challenges and and come out successfully. Uh, and finally, uh, let me once again switching gears and switching planets almost. Uh, not really, Moon is not a planet, but this was a demonstration of you know using similar principles whether we could um, uh, demonstrate the ability to three D print parts using lunar regolith or the lunar soil or in fact Martian soil and so on. But in this case, I'm just presenting a case where we targeted the Artemis. 
uh, mission of NASA, which is to return to the moon. And uh, what we worked with, um, driven by two students, um, uh, Habibur Rahman and Anna Hayes, along with Mohammed Shafi at SIE, what we demonstrated was the fact that uh, if you can go, um, um, that you just need 10% uh, of feedstock that needs to be carried. You can use indigenous soil out there, 90% uh, using the lunar ice and the lunar regolith to 3D print parts, not just structures, but also functional devices. For example, in this case, what we demonstrated was you could uh, make these parts, but in principle, we can also make functional uh, devices ultimately leading to 3D printable photovoltaics or other um, you know, electronic devices that in principle could be a 3D print up there. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention was, uh, this was a pitch that we made to at the AIAA conference uh, to Lockheed, funded by Lockheed, and uh, we did win the first prize in this uh, for the most innovative um, um, pitch towards a lunar institute research utilization. So in, in this sense, what we have demonstrated is you know, the, the wide versatility of, of the AM um, aspects, as well as all the engineering going on on campus that leverages the advantages of AM to really push the field forward in many different directions. I think, um, Andrew, so yeah, this is the final you know, just to show you. And before I hand this off to Andrew, uh, so the last we're going to conclude by talking about how we are also pushing the frontiers of workforce development and creating new learning modules that could be put online. And, uh, you know, not just for the students, but also for industry personnel. Andrew, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, uh, and this is where we can really take advantage of a lot of the work that's been done here on virtual reality or augmented reality training systems. Uh, to come up with ways to train people, not only for future engineering careers, but also people that might want to work as an engineering technician and work with these types of machines in practice. And so we've developed a interactive VR platform that helps to guide students through uh, tasks like how to set up an AM machine, how to load in the materials, how to start printing and things like that. And so we can really, you know, take a virtual environment and teach a student how to operate a, a fused deposition modeling or FDM 3D printer run through things like determining optimal frame parameters or apply troubleshooting techniques to, to rectify any procedural errors that they might run across. And so the platform could look something like this, where you have an online platform, you could distribute this anywhere all over the world, just via the internet, and then some kind of a, a virtual environment that simulates what they would have to, to deal with in running these machines. And so with this, you can have a inexpensive, flexible way to train uh, potential operators for these types of systems. And we're working to expand this sort of a environment to include different types of printers and different types of tasks. And so that really leads into sort of our overall workforce development goals and, and other things we're doing, such as uh, developing a, a minor in additive manufacturing in the College of Engineering. And this is really based on feedback we've had from regional industry folks that have identified a big need for enhanced workforce, uh, workforce development in, in additive manufacturing in general, but including uh, uh, some of this AM. And the uh, so there are like 70 or so AM centers, it changes a lot over time, uh, nationally and internationally that are, that are trying to develop different types of workforce development and training programs here. So, so why us? Um, we really are looking at serving a lot of the local industries. You know, we've got folks like Raytheon here in town, we've got Honeywell and Phoenix. They're, they're people that really are, are seeing a, a high, high demand for people with these sorts of skill sets. And we've developed a minor that helps to uh, bring in students from all over the College of Engineering. They can take a, a certain set of classes in added manufacturing from a lot of the different departments and come up with something that is this kind of an interdisciplinary approach to added manufacturing education. Um, and so it really helps with not just uh, getting students from here prepared for the future, but also in workforce development for our local industries and, and helping to keep Arizona competitive economically. It also provides a nice uh, way to interact with the folks at Pima Community College and developing uh, transfer credit and curriculum access partnerships with them as well. And that can help to also drive some of the technician development that is a priority for a lot of our local industry as well. So we're really excited about the, this uh, minor in AM and how that's going to develop over the years and, and, and start to incorporate a lot of the different departments around the College of Engineering. 
So that's what we have. I appreciate your attention, and uh, I think we're going to go move into that question and answer session. Excellent. Thank you both Andrew and Krishna for setting the stage for our Q&A. Um, if you want to unshare your slides, we'll dive right into the questions. So that was, I think you really set the table nicely. So Andrew, I'm going to start with you and take a, so let me actually remind the audience. So many of you have pre-submitted questions, which I've selected from, and I've been pulling in real time from the Q&A. So we'll continue to get to as many questions as we can. I apologize if we don't get to everyone. So Andrew, I'm going to jump into a question that was submitted about cost. How do total costs compare with additive manufacturing to traditional assembly line type manufacturing? And further, if you wanna maybe comment on the abilities of AM to customize parts that may not be available with those traditional assembly lines. Yeah, so a lot of the advantages for AM are based on this idea of customization or being able to make things that you couldn't traditionally make in any way. And, and when we were looking at a lot of these different parts of places like GE, a lot of the conclusions we would come to economically was if you try to replace the exact same part with the AM version of the part, that's not usually going to be economically advantageous. But you can look at a systems-wide approach where I can combine 10 or 15 parts into a single part. I can reduce a lot of the design and administrative overhead that comes with that, and I can get some kind of a performance or system advantage. And a lot of times that in itself would give you an economic advantage as well by consolidating all these parts. So in terms of the economics of AM, a lot of times taking advantage of the other freedoms for things like design flexibility it gives you will actually end up being the source of these economic advantages. Excellent, thank you. Krishna, I'm gonna kind of combine two questions submitted and pulled from the audience. So when we talk about additive manufacturing, can it be used to make useful things for the Tucson and Tucson area, perhaps even using recycled materials and then kind of as a follow on, are we engaging with any small businesses in the area? Great. Um, so let me answer the questions in sequence, I think. Um, so this is a great question. And, um, you know, when it comes to using local materials, I think I'll, uh, we've been working a lot with professors like uh, Mo Myers in mining engineering, Lian Yang Zhang, and, and Zhang, uh, Lian Yang in civil, and Zhang in uh, uh, mining too, uh, for developing like geopolymers, which are basically, um, you know, waste materials sourced from mine tailings or fly ash or whatever, and converting them into useful feedstock, be it for construction materials uh, and beyond that. So one example that I've developed, that we have developed with MoMA is was a 3D printing of ceramic foams using um, these waste materials that are mine tailings, which are aluminum silicate remnants. Uh, the other work that's also undergoing, that's been going on is like uh, Alithia, Aida at um, uh, Kapla uh, Architecture, along with Mohammed Shafi and, and Mo Maez, have been developing architectural materials. How do you, you know, blend with the local, using local soil and local resources? Now, when it comes to, you know, uh, recycled materials can mean different things. In this case, I used a very specific, you know, uh, geopolymer example as a construct for construction material. But uh, work from Doug Loy, for example, where uh, he's developed a radically new polymer uh, composite system, uh, which could be repeatedly repurposed. So you can 3D print a part. Imagine like you have your shoe. I'm just so an example, uh, uh, which is 3D printed. And then you, you board of it. You can, in principle, you know, repurpose um, it and, and 3D print a cell phone cover out of it, for example, or, you know, you can, in fact, the great thing about it is you can incorporate local soil or waste material, it could be coffee grounds and increase its structural mechanical integrity and maybe 3D print a, a part for your washing machine. So stuff like that, this uh, AM really allows you, you know, it's you're limited by your imagination at this point. Uh, so I, I think in that sense, what, what we think from a global point of view is uh, manufacturing can be very resourceful, can be sustainable and very local. And that's what AIM allows you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's a lot of uh, impetus on campus towards that. Uh, regarding your second question, uh, working with local, uh, local small businesses, I think um, a few of us uh, in different um, uh, times, we reached out to local businesses like Quake Rap, for example, uh, Doug had, Doug and George Francisco had, had worked with them. 
Um, there are uh, other examples when we reached out to uh, local businesses, uh, do, when we were trying to get the 3D printing of COVID masks going, we could have decentralized uh, places where you could 3D print that. But I, I think really it's the tip of the iceberg um, and we really take this opportunity uh, we'll treat this as an opportunity to reach out to local uh, businesses and, and really ask them to, you know, come come to us, we'll go to them and, and uh, really explore collaborative opportunities. Good. I was going to thank you for that, Krishna. I was going to say our new associate dean for research, Mark Van Dyke, is actively seeking to engage with companies in the area. So anyone that's interested in collaborating with Andrew or Krishna, just contact me or Mark directly and we can put you in touch. Thank you for that. Um, Andrew, going back to you. You know, we hear a lot about big data, artificial intelligence. What advances have been made in the realms of AM? And in particular, we hear a lot about, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning for discovery of new alloys. So if you have any experience in that, let us know. And then furthermore, are we as a college investing in, in AI and ML in the context of additive manufacturing? Yeah, this is definitely a big topic in material science for additive manufacturing. That the cost of developing a material is, is typically very high when you're talking about metals. A new alloy is typically in the millions of dollars. One advantage of, of the uh, additive manufacturing process, especially these laser powder infusions, you can make a lot of small samples with different processing parameters all at one time. You can evaluate the microstructure of those and pull a lot of data out of that sort of thing. But then what do you do with all this data? How can you glean some insight into what the change in your processing parameters means for the structure of the material and their after its use. Uh, and that's where AI can really be helpful. It's to, it's to screen through things like large amounts of image data from, from microscopes uh, or through a large volume of mechanical testing data and really start to understand the influence of processing on the microstructure and the mechanical properties in this, this whole paradigm. And so people are actively using that uh, to try to develop uh, not just new alloys, but also new post-processing heat treatments, uh, new uh, parameters for the machines themselves, and really kind of build that into a, a fully functional chain of processes that gives you what you want at the end, and then predicts how that's going to perform in service. And so the, there are small companies out there that uh, have, have started getting into that business that are, that are developing alloys, and I think that's going to bear fruit in a few years. There are other companies that are doing things like estimating fatigue capability for aerospace components based on a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, so, so yeah, that's a, a very important thing uh, for, for that industry. And I think the University of Arizona, especially since we have a data science institute here, we've got folks in the systems and industrial engineering department that are specialists in, in AI and machine learning. Uh, we're in a, a very good position to, to take advantage of, of these trends and, and uh, use those types of tools to develop useful things. Excellent. Good. That's exciting to hear about. In the past, I've spoken at different forums about engineering's rich history in mining. Um, you both touched, uh, Krishna, you touched on space applications in your talk, and this generates a lot of excitement from people. Do you want to just, you know, expand a little bit more on the prospects of space mining of raw materials and then you know, using additive manufacturing to do space construction and assembly? Sure, uh, Andrew, I'll go if you don't mind. Right. Um, so yeah, no, this is, uh, we as, as material scientists, we are very interested in that. And uh, of course, you know, you have the experts in mining, so they may have a different um, thought about this. But, uh, you know, we've been, as a department, we've been uh, involved at least peripherally in uh, lots of the space materials analysis, uh, along with the, uh, planetary Materials Research Group at LPL, uh, that includes Tom Zega, Don Taylor, Etta, Jessica, and uh, Pierre Hanekor. Uh, and like work like OSIRIS-REx, you know, OSIRIS-REx tries to answer a very profound question through their sample return, which is, you know, origin of life, what's, when was uh, the, when and under what conditions these materials were formed on those uh, asteroids, so on. I think, but those are just the tip of the iceberg, right? I think where we really think uh, we can, uh, through AM, make a big impact is we envision a future, you know, where you have like a machine learning or AI driven disposable drones that can go all the way, uh, 3D map the, the topography and the topology of, of your, of, of whatever rocks that you're interested in, can analyze the soil, the regolith, uh, also not just the top surface, but also the interior of the materials. And then we can design 
uh, very specific protocols based on what we gather for materials processing. It could just be, you know, for 3D printing, like what we demonstrated, or it could even be for metal extraction, you know, high priority metals that you can extract it in, uh, in situ, get it back. Um, or, or it could be even like water, uh, you know, mining uh, water ice and then either separating it into H2 and O2 for fuel and oxygen for sustenance and fuel, for example. It could serve as habitat construction, you know, additive manufacturing can help you uh, both have from habitat construction point of view, also for repair and refurbishment purposes, for refueling purposes, for example. There are all these missions that are going to Europa, for example, and you may need multiple stops. So how could we, you know, leverage all those towards, you know, um, using planetary resources towards that. Uh, so I think these can all be leveraged into, into future space missions uh, where, you know, not the focus is just not sample returns, but also you know, space mining, space manufacturing and um, space readiness for further uh, exploration and discovery. Excellent, good. Andrew, I'm gonna go back to you and I'm gonna kind of, our, our audience loves technical questions, so I'm gonna kind of combine three into one. <laughs> So, you know, people have asked, can you talk about the material strength of AM parts versus, you know, equivalent parts made by casting or forging? Part two of that is, do we are actively involved in doing material testing, failure testing as part of our own research programs? And then thirdly, can you connect by metallics? Can you sort of flow one material into another to com compete, you know, to complete like a homogeneous part that has two different materials joined seamlessly together. So that's a lot, but I know this is your expertise, so I'm going to let you roll with this. I'll, I'll start with the last one first. Uh, as far as biometallic or, or mixed structure materials, that's certainly an active area for investigation. But a lot of these processes are basically welding processes. So if you think about the laser powder bed process I'd shown that was uh, you're spreading a thin layer of powder and using a laser to essentially weld that layer over the top of another. So there's been a lot of work over the years on bimetallic welding. So can you join aluminum to steel for making in automotive structures, for instance? And, and some welding methods are appropriate for doing that. And so there are gonna be similar added manufacturing challenges for making multi-unit material systems. They're gonna to have to have the same sorts of technology developments occur for those to work. But in principle, you could use different ways of joining these materials together in some kind of a format, one distributed one than the other, or doing multi-material structures where you put one material in a certain region and another material in another to get some balance of mechanical behavior that's appealing. So it's gonna be a very active uh, area of investigation. Um, as far as the, the behavior of these materials in uh, an atom manufacturing process versus the cast or the rot version, there are gonna be differences that we see because we're forming something with a very different microstructure. And the microstructure of these metals really determines its mechanical behavior and service. And we've always had differences between cast metals and forged metals in that sense. And this is going to simply be a third paradigm where we're going to need to develop alloys that take advantage of the particulars of the additive manufacturing process and, and sort of mitigate the disadvantages in terms of the types of structures we're going to form. And so we don't typically use the same alloy in casting as we do in forging. And added manufacturing in the longer term is probably going to be a third uh, leg of this where we have to have uh, custom made alloys to really take advantage of the process to the greatest extent possible. That's I think gonna be a, a big area for research for me personally in the next 20 years, uh, but just across the, the world in general. Uh, as far as mechanical testing goes, uh, we have some capability for that on, on campus here. I'm actually uh, working to establish a lot more capability for that, especially in terms of fatigue test. And that's gonna be a, a very big deal for atom manufacturing is understanding the cyclic durability of these types of materials uh, under the conditions that they're gonna see in service and, and how things like processing defects are going to, to influence that. So that's definitely gonna be a big area of emphasis for us here in the, the coming years. Excellent, good. I'm gonna throw kind of a toss up question um, and the answer might be, we're not sure. And if it is, just tell me and we'll move on. But this one intrigued me. So we hear a lot about the, the graphene, this, this um, carbon-like, uh, you know, graphite-like structure that has great thermal properties and, and strength properties, miracle material, but often it's difficult to create it in large scale or bulk. So 
can additive manufacturing bridge the gap of using graphene to make smaller or individualized parts? So there's a lot in there. Maybe you know something about it, maybe you don't. So I'm going to toss it out there. Yeah, I think actually that's a great question. And uh, at the UFA, we develop technology, I mean, methods to, and it's not you know unique to UFA, it's, it's pretty well known to create large scale, uh, what we call chemically modified graphene. Uh, in, in bulk quantities. In fact, we've also worked with, a, you know, I missed out that opportunity with a small business in uh, Phoenix. Uh, towards that, uh, they using mine graphite. Some of the unique things that we are doing with graphene or any other 2D structure, 2D material or even fullerenes or carbon nanotubes is to create uh, inks, graphene inks, or, or, you know, typically nanoparticle inks where you could, um, where you can 3D print uh, circuits, so you can like like an inkjet printer. At the simplest, you can three you can print a circuit. Uh, you can make like you know very you can address very specific parts, uh, modify their properties locally by you know hitting it with a laser or or you know chemically treating it very locally. So what it allows you to do is to to have multifunctionality uh, and and on the same real estate. You know, you can create uh, many different uh, mini structures and mini functionalities, if you may. And uh, so, yes, we have actually demonstrated uh, on campus, I mean, uh, at the AMI, the ability to 3D print uh, highly um, conductive uh, pathways to, to high uh, thermal interface materials for, uh, for semiconductors and, uh, you know, up and uh, electrically modified uh, transparent windows, for example, all those stuff we've uh, demonstrated that, and and other areas where this really has a great impact is for in, in instance top topological acoustics and topological um, uh, and electronics, for example. And we we'd love to answer more questions if you have. Okay, good. Um, Andrew, do you want to add anything, or you want to just shall we just move on? Let's move on. Okay, good. <laughs> I stick with you though, Andrew. Let's look back at space or you may be in the research lab, not quite in space. What are maybe advantages or challenges of using AM in, in very low atmospheric pressure, such as in space or maybe in the lab or even zero gravity? Yeah, so the, the process I talked about was this laser powder bed fusion process. And it, it's not really something that you could use in a zero gravity environment. You're, you're really working the powder. It's gonna get everywhere if you're trying to print with that uh, without gravity to sort of hold it down. And so, the types of processes that are appropriate are going to vary depending on what type of environment you're in. If you're in kind of an orbital environment where you're really in a zero gravity type of a situation, you're going to need to look at something that's fed by a wire or something that is, is something where you can handle the material in zero gravity. Um, but if you're working in a vacuum, there are uh, types of energy sources like electron guns, which have to be run in a vacuum anyway, uh, which could prevent potentially be much easier to use in that environment than they are here on Earth, where you have to put them in a vacuum chamber, chamber and pump it down and things like that. So uh, sort of a prototype metal 3D printing system I'd seen for use on the ISS was based on a uh, electron beam wire fed process. And it's something that's used here, but I think that kind of a system could be more ubiquitous in, in space applications than maybe you would see terrestrially. So it's just going to be a lot of developing of the right way to uh, operate that type of a process with the same idea of 3D printing structures, I think, can be done using that. Uh, and similar things are going to have to be considered when it comes to feedstock development, right? If I'm using some kind of process, trying to make a metallic feedstock on the moon and then feed it into one of these printers, with that low gravity, the powder process may not be appropriate. I may have to consider how I can take an extractive metallurgy process, essentially, and then make wire from that. Right. Very a lot of challenges there. A lot of good challenges. Krishna, I'm going to come back to you. Now, how might the research you and, and your colleagues are doing, Andrew and others, help shape the cost of additive manufacturing machines to allow more businesses to leverage this technology? Um, so, I, I think, you know, and it's a multi-tiered answer. Uh, for example, it is now possible to, you know, use Amazon and order a hundred dollar three D printer. Uh, for example, you're limited in certain sense, but it is possible. So there is this cost from a cost point of view. There's a variety of options available. I I feel like more than the cost of AIM machines because with scale the cost is going to come down. 
I think where uh, you know uh, innovations are required for more businesses to adopt uh, AM is really to bring down the cost of uh, you know or provide inexpensive design tools where uh, the 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 business can virtually you know find out which designs work best for them, which will provide them the best bang for the buck. For example, so inexpensive design tools. Uh, integrating inexpensive part qualification, right? I mean, I 3D print a part and now how do I know whether it satisfies a certain ASTM standard? I don't know because these are very super specialized parts. So could we develop inline qualification protocols, you know, using uh, inexpensive sensing to come up with that? All these are bells and whistles that could be added to the AM machine, but really provides uh, benefits much greater than um, you know, just a standalone AM machine. And ultimately, you know, and uh, driving down materials costs. Sometimes, you know, if you if you take into account you 3D print a part, it's not up to standards. You throw it away. If you if you if you integrate those costs of waste and uh, recycling and sustainability costs, you know, trying to come up with these uh, new materials, for example, that Doug Law is working on, could all bring down uh, and 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 really democratize manufacturing in some sense. So some of the ideas that we are actually pursuing in this arena is, you know. Um, what we think of like a shared economy for 3D printing, ultimately, could you, you know, have an app order uh, someone with a AIM machine down the road has it and could you just order a specialized part for your washing machine, something like that. So, or could you consider instead of Kinko's, you know, just where you go photocopy, could we have a Kinko's for 3D printing, you know, I have a part, I email the STL, the, the file to them, CAT file, and then they 3D print it to you and you come and get it. And those are opportunities for small businesses to not, I mean, this also allows the small business to work with large industries for, you know, one-off parts for part obsolescence, but also, you know, you, I think we, there could be an economy around, around the shared economy, around uh, additive itself. Again. Good, good, good stuff. Um, Time is flying by, Andrew. I'm going to try to give you two questions. <laughs> so you've worked on advanced turbine blades. Someone asks, can you use additive manufacturing for thermal protection systems or schemes with additive manufacturing? And this sort of a follow-up is when you talk about turbine blades to actually go in commercial aircraft, you know, what are some of the experiences that you might have been part of in getting those certified, right? And on those first flights of, of actual aircraft. So they're kind of related, but a little different. So I'm gonna let you take both of those. Yeah, so uh, we're not to the point yet in terms of uh, kind of validated quality of those sorts of materials in that application uh, to be able to print a turbine blade or rotating part for a jet engine. Like, there's still a lot of work that has to be done and understanding how these parts are gonna fail in service before you can get to the point where you're able to FAA certify a lot of those things. Uh, so as far as turbine blades go, they are using 3D printing to make turbine blades, but not actually in printing the blade, it's actually printing the molds in which to cast the blades. And so it's not just the blade itself that's that's important there. You, you can They have a lot of these different complex cooling structures within them that involve uh, pumping air through the blade itself and then film air cooling. And then you get this very complicated configuration of all these channels. And so we can actually 3D print these molds for casting the blade uh, and the cores that go inside the blade that define those cooling channels. So, so there's a, a lot of work behind that. And that's actually very interesting in that it's a ceramic printing technology that's been done for that. You're printing a ceramic mold. So I saw a question in Q&A about can you print ceramics? Absolutely. The process is going to be a little bit different. A lot of times this is going to be a uh, a binder based process where you deposit this ceramic with a binder and then burn out the binder and center it in, a, in an oven. So um, the process can be a bit different, but it's certainly possible to print ceramics. And that's really how we're approaching complex cooling structures within these things like turbine blades. And the same thing could be true for something like hypersonic vehicle. If you're going to use something like film air cooling across the leading edge of a wing, you could come up with a complicated structure with all these cooling channels in it to accomplish that using AM. Yeah, you talk about the complexities of turbine blades, and we had a very famous fan blade failure, what, over Denver not that long ago. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but you're right. The, the, the stresses and loads on those are very complicated, and so we're not quite there with the 3D printed blades, but it's nice that you're printing the molds. Um, you know, this has taken us really to the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank both Andrew and Krishna. This has been a very lively discussion. I also want to thank our audience members. We've had the most submitted questions of any of our, I think, eight lecture series today. We're, we're almost to 30 plus questions. 
So you guys, everyone out there has been really engaged and I'm grateful for that. I want to thank our production team, David, Brian, for making this happen. Again, our audience, our, our speakers, have a great day. Thank you for attending and I uh, wish everyone a, a good day. All the best.